Hello, Crossbridge. Thank you for joining us online. We want to invite you to interact with us throughout this worship service. Go to the chat box. Let us know where you're watching this from. Let us know who you are. Uh, and remember, just because church is online, it's still church because we are the church. So let's worship God today.
we look to you in this time with me, Lord. We've never needed you more, Father, Father God. And we know that you are in control. You will always be in control, Father God. So we're just going to trust you in this season, Father God. We may not know what's coming before us, Father God, but you, we know that you are before us. Let's sing this together. I will love 
Hello, church. It's great to find you in this virtual space. Today, we are launching a sermon series officially. It's an uh, Easter sermon series, and we're doing that with our global family of churches, the Bridge Movement. The series is entitled Mysterious Messiah, and it's about the life and the work of Jesus. Uh, this is a season I think that's uh, very appropriate to talk about Easter because it's as if the world is on that dark Friday when Jesus uh, was crucified and uh, the disciples worried and mourned. And uh, we need Easter because Easter is a message of hope that God, even in the midst of darkness, is doing something good and something beautiful. I remember C.S. Lewis writing at some point in time on the topic of suffering, saying that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Think about that. We're going through a season of pain and suffering. A lot of people are worried about their jobs. They're worried about the fact that their kids are going to stay in the house for the next several weeks or even months. They don't know what to do with their kids. Uh, it, it is a season of much anxiety and worry. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to the economy. We don't know how this is going to affect every aspect of life. And so it, it, it's, it's in a season such as this that uh, many people have now become very open to this topic of God and spirituality. And so I want to encourage you during this season to be open to the idea of God, to be open uh, to the person of God. Uh, God wants to meet you in this very season. And the passage that uh, we have in front of you is a passage that has to do with that. I want to invite you to uh, read with me from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. You can open your Bible or you can, uh, you know, log into the Bible app in your phone. And you can punch in Matthew 16, 13 through 18. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't know if you saw the picture uh, that was spread uh, on the online platforms of the Christ the Redeemer in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, my home country, being lit up with the different flags of the countries that have been affected by the coronavirus. People sense that God is closer, that God is near. Now, God has always been close and God has always been near, but our perception in times like these, they change. And the real question is not whether God is close or not, because he is always near. He's a transcendent God, but he's also an imminent God. But the question for us, I believe, is how can we encounter God during this season? And I want to encourage you to encounter God in three specific ways that are listed here indirectly in this passage. First, by listening to him. Secondly, by drawing near to him. And thirdly, by joining him. There's an invitation at the very end. Uh, first, by listening to him. Now, there's a difference between hearing and listening. My wife points to me every once in a while that I'm hearing, but I am not listening. Hearing uh, just takes not being deaf and being able to listen to, to sounds and to have a good, good ear and healthy ear. Uh, but listening means uh, focusing. Uh, listening takes attention. Listening means interacting. And listening means taking that which is being said to you to heart. Uh, here in this passage, Jesus is speaking. Uh, in the passage that we read last week from Mark 4, uh, that passage in Mark 4, verse 41, it ends with the disciples asking the question to one another, who is this that even the wind obeys his commands? Now, this passage today, Jesus begins by asking a question. Uh, Jesus asks a general question to the disciples. He gathers the disciples in a uh, historic site, a uh, religiously historic site, and he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, this question that Jesus first asked the disciples, it's uh, an easy question, and it's also a safe question. 
it's an easy question because it's easy to talk about the opinions that people have of a particular topic, in this case, God. It's easier to talk about others than it is about ourselves. And it's safer because you don't have to put your neck out there. Uh, sometimes uh, we are afraid of, of being misunderstand, uh, misunderstood. We're afraid of being judged. And so Jesus starts by asking this general question, who do people say that I am? The response of the disciples, it's, it's here in verse 14. Uh, they said, some say that uh, you are John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, uh, Jesus does not want to stay here in this general space. Jesus' intention is uh, not for them to describe how others feel about him. Jesus knows he is God. Jesus wants to get to their hearts. And so Jesus asks the follow-up question. He goes from the general to the more specific. He goes from the impersonal to the personal. He asks them, now, who do you say that I am? Now, Jesus has already gotten the attention of the disciples because of the place and the backdrop of this conversation. The place where Jesus finds himself with the disciples is Caesarea Philippi. I wonder why the I wonder if the disciples were asking the question, where is he taking us as Jesus was walking to this place with them? But, you know, when Jesus arrives at the place, you know, they knew the place because uh, it was a uh, place that was known to be a place of worship. Uh, there were altars at that, uh, at that, that, that mountainside uh, to the many gods of their culture. Uh, there was the altar of uh, the pan god. It was there. And also there was an altar to uh, the Roman emperor. And so uh, that was a very interesting backdrop. And uh, Jesus asks this question to the disciples in front of that religious site known to the disciples and to everyone in that culture. Who do you say that I am? Uh, I, I know what people are saying of me, but how about you? How are you taking this in? How are you experiencing that? And I'm thinking about this question that Jesus is asking the disciples in the context in which we find ourselves. Because many of us have opinions of what God may be doing in the world through this crisis. I've heard pastors talk about it. I've heard friends of mine, preachers online, uh, address this. But the real question that all of us may ask is, what is God saying to you in this season? I, I, I believe that uh, as in that episode uh, that we read about here in Matthew 16, Jesus is also pressing in to every single one of us, and he is asking the question to you today, who do you say that I am? What do you think I am doing in the world? Am I your Lord and Savior? Do you think that I am in control, that I got this? Then why all the anxiety? Then why all the fear in your heart? I believe that Jesus is asking many of us, am I just an idea to you? Am I just a concept to you? Or am I real to you? Do I live in your head, in your books, in your Bible, the one that sits in your living room right now, or the, maybe the one that you're holding? Or do I live in your heart? Am I real to you? I don't want us to waste the season that God is speaking to us uh, in such a clear and loud way. I, I want us to take advantage of the season that we're going through, and I want us to talk to God, and I want us to ask him back, God, what are you telling me? What are you teaching me? I want us to be transformed and change during the season. You know, in the Bible, there is a beautiful story of someone that went through a lot of pain and suffering. It's the person of Job in the book of Job in the Bible. And as he was going through all the pain and the struggles and the suffering that he was going through, he uh, had conversations with his friends, with his wife, with God. He shares his thoughts and his ideas of what was happening to him. But at the very end, he comes out of that situation. He comes out of that season changed as a person. In verse uh, 42, after having conversations with God, Job realizes that my ears had heard you. But now my eyes actually see you. 
My hope is that you will see God in a very clear way during this season. But you must cut through the noise. There's a lot of noise around us. You must cut through the noise because God is, in fact, speaking. And he's speaking to you. So listen. But also draw near. Uh, In verse 16, Peter takes the initiative and answers the question that Jesus asked the disciples on behalf of the disciples. You know, Peter is known for always jumping the gun. Uh, Peter is impatient. There are the passages in the Bible that we learn of Peter's impatience. And he takes initiative and he answers the question and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter is making an astounding statement. He is acknowledging that Jesus, in fact, is God. To which Jesus responds in the following verse, Simon Peter, blessed are you because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, what Jesus is saying with that statement in response to Peter's statement is that the only way to know God is if God chooses to reveal himself to us. At that very moment, he's acknowledging that Peter's acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity was only possible because God had revealed that to Peter. And I believe that in this season, God is making himself known. He is revealing more of his character to us. That he is a God who is in charge, that he is a God who is in control, but also that he is a God who is loving. Uh, During this season, we are learning about the character of God in ways in which we couldn't learn before. Because these situations, my friends, are very real to us. And, you know, what Jesus is also saying is that God not only is making himself known, but he wants to make himself known to us so that we will draw near to him. It's possible to be in relationship with God. Why? Because God is a person, and he can be known personally. See, if you want to know me personally, there's many ways that you can know me. Uh, You can Google my name online. You can uh, type my name on your Google engine, and you can press enter, and a lot of information uh, will come up about me. Uh, Some of it may be true. Some of it may be false. I don't know. But information will come up about me. Uh, Or you can choose to ask my friends. That's another way to try to get to know me is to go to uh, my friends, to go to my family, and to ask questions like, how is Felipe? Tell me uh, about um, his character. Tell me about the things that he likes to do. Tell me about his strengths. Tell me about his weaknesses. That's another way to get to know me, and you'll get some information about me. But you can also come to me and you can say, hey, come to my house. And uh, as I go to your house, you can open a bottle of wine, good wine. You can uh, serve me a piece of thick steak. And as we go into the night eating and drinking, you can ask me questions such as, share with me some of your fondest childhood memories. Or what are your dreams and aspirations for the future and for your kids? What are your fears? What are the things that you like to do the most? What are your favorite books and favorite movies? See, that is the best way to know me personally, by addressing me as a person, an individual. Not going to others, but going directly to me. And, you know, during this season, Jesus is inviting us to draw near to him and to know him personally. How? Through the church. See, the key to understanding this text is in verse 18. Uh, Verse 18 speaks of the foundation of the church. It's in this context that Jesus tells his disciples, I am going to form a community, a people, a family that will serve as my witness into the world. He says there in verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, uh, the church is described in other books of the Bible as the body of Christ. It's the primary way by which Jesus can be made known into the world. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the body. Jesus is made known through us. Think about that reality. See, during the season of social distancing, 
it's easy for us to isolate ourselves. It's easy for us to, uh, to begin to feel very distant from others because we lose that human contact. But I would encourage you during this season not to isolate yourself, but to stay in contact. I uh, want you to use of the means that we're making available to you, uh, the, vi- the various chat rooms, the prayer meetings that are happening online, the, uh, the uh, online and virtual happy hours that are happening on Friday. Beth and I, we just hosted one this past Friday, and it was amazing. Uh, to spend time uh, with other brothers and sisters sharing life and and sharing the lessons that we are learning during this season. Stay connected to the church because the church is the body of Christ. That's how Christ can be made known to you, only through the church. Draw near, but ultimately join him. See, uh, not only can we encounter God by listening to him or by drawing near, by staying in community with the people of God, but also by joining Jesus in his mission. As I said to you, the backdrop is very important for us to understand what Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples and to us here today. What Jesus, in essence, is saying is that his kingdom is bursting forth, that despite all the different spiritual rulers and political rulers of the world like Caesar, that his kingdom is bursting forth and is pushing hell back. It's putting hell on the defense. What an amazing statement that Jesus is making. You know, uh, during a season such as this, it's easy for us to sense the proximity of death, to feel that darkness and hell are winning. Some of us will lose our jobs. Some of us will lose our resources. Some of us will lose loved ones. Some of us uh, will lose our health. Many have already lost some of those things. And it it feels sometimes that hell is triumphing. But with this statement of Jesus, we can truly be encouraged today. Our hearts can be truly filled with hope. Why? Because Jesus is promising us that hell will not win because he has already conquered death and hell. Yes, Jesus is speaking. Yes, Jesus is making himself known during the season, especially through the church. But Jesus is also on the move, and he is inviting us to join him. One of the things that missiologist Leslie Newbegin said was that uh, uh, mission is simply the desire to be where Jesus is, where Jesus is. Where is Jesus right now? Jesus right now is redeeming the world, and he is inviting us in a season of darkness to help redeem the world with him. That's the, beautiful, that's the beautiful aspect of the church is that the church is partnering with Christ to redeem all things. You know, when we, uh, you know, read the Bible, that's what we learn, that Jesus launched his redemption enterprise in the resurrection and he completes it in the book of Revelation. One day, uh, we will look at all of creation And the words of Jesus in Revelation 21, verse 5, will echo. I have made all things new. He is. He is making all things new. And he is inviting us to join him. So how do we join Jesus in this work of redemption and putting hell on the defense? By serving and sacrificing. Because the way in which Jesus unleashed the power of the resurrection into the world was first by taking upon himself the powers of hell. On the cross, Jesus experienced the agonies of hell. On the cross, Jesus descended into Hades as we affirm in the Apostles' Creed so that hell and death and evil will no longer have control over our lives. And so the way in which we partner with Jesus, the way in which we join him in his mission, the way in which we're transformed by this relationship with him, which, by the way, all relationships really change us. The more you spend time with people, the more you begin to adopt some of their habits, the more you begin to like some of the things that they like, the more you begin to align your lives with their life. 
You know, when I first married my wife, uh, there were things that she didn't like about me. There were things that I liked and she didn't like about me that I liked those things. And she ended up, you know, giving into that. And today she likes some of the very things that I like, some of the food, some of the music. The same with me. You know, when uh, we first got married, I, I didn't like country music, but uh, the relationship has allowed me to appreciate even uh, country music because relationships changes. And the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we engage Jesus in service and sacrifice, the more we will participate with him in the renewal of all things. And so this is an invitation for you, church, in a season such as this to join Jesus in what he is doing in the world. I was thinking of three practical ways of how we, the church, can join and participate with Jesus in that which he is doing in the world. And the, the first one uh, is uh, isolating ourselves. Now, I know that uh, um, things may not get any easier. They'll, they'll get harder and there will be a temptation to leave our house and uh, experience human contact with people. But until our authorities say that that's not good, uh, we shouldn't do it. Uh, today, loving our neighbors equals staying away from our neighbors, right? That's what it means to love our neighbors today, uh, is to keep this infection from spreading to flattening the curve. So that's a very practical way that you can serve and sacrifice for others is by staying home. Uh, secondly, uh, by becoming a beacon of encouragement into this world. Uh, use your online platforms to share verses, to share encouraging thoughts. Uh, share this sermon with others. Share our services with others. Uh, the content that we're posting online, share with people. Uh, the prayer meetings that are happening, invite people uh, to participate live in those prayer meetings and the happy hours that are happening on Friday. Be a person of encouragement. While the world is surrounded by negative, negativity, be a voice of positivity, of pointing people towards the hope that is Jesus. And then lastly, support the work of the church. Pray for us. Pray for us leaders as we seek wisdom of how to navigate uh, the church through this very difficult season. Support the church financially. Continue to do so. Um, engage in the ministry opportunities that we are making available online. Do that because when you serve and you sacrifice, you join Jesus in his mission. So listen to him. Draw near to him and join him. Let's continue to worship. God bless you. Amen.
sing amen. benediction for you. Sing this over your life. Join us as we sing this. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children Sing that out. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, in your children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, in your children, and their children. Children, may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, he is for you. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Silver. I'm the campus pastor here at Crossbridge Key Biscayne. And if this is the first time that you have checked us out, I encourage you to fill out a digital connect card. That way we could go ahead and send you information about what's happening in the life of our church. Also, you could just simply reach out to us through our Instagram or social media. If you put a message there, I myself will be responding to you. In a, in a short moment. We want you to be excited about what's happening in the life of our church. We know that this is a different time. We're seeing that there's a lot of limitations on our gathering, but we have a program for you for this week. So follow us on our Instagram account, follow us on our uh, Facebook account, because we're gonna have different activities happening throughout the weeks. We have prayer time, we have community groups happening, we have Bible studies happening, we even have a Friday happy hour where you get to spend some time with one of our pastors. I wanna invite you to also text the word A to the number on the screen 
because this is how we could, as a church, could reach out and help you if you need any help. If you need groceries, if you are either elderly or if you have limitations on getting out, we want to be here for you. Or if you know someone that needs help, please text the word aid and we will definitely be reaching out to you and seeing how we can serve you as a church. We believe that we are here to serve our community. We're for the city and we want to be engaged in doing that. We want to invite you to be generous. Second Corinthians chapter nine talks about how God wants us to be a cheerful giver. God wants us to be generous. And in this time, it's even more important. We want to invite you to go to our webpage, click on the giving link and give from the bottom of your heart, give sacrificially because there are lots of needs in the community. We are trying as a church to be a 50-50 church. We want all of 50% of what comes in goes directly to serve the needs of our village, of our city. So we encourage you during this time to be generous, be cheerful and give so like that we could continue to do the work of the church here in Miami. Finally, I just wanna thank you again for joining us online. Follow us on our social media accounts so you can stay tuned to the different activities that we have going on this week. And God bless, and we'll be seeing you soon.